so uh, I'm you right now, okay? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Kara Swisher. I'm, I'm a writer, a podcaster, and a tech genius. And you're watching okay. Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Oh, you want me to do that? Oh. That's a cold mm. open, yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't, we don't usually... <clears throat> Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with the incomparable Kara Swisher. Kara, welcome to the show. Thank you. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? <laughs> Which one? I have a lot of jobs. Well, let's go back in the chronology okay. to young Kara. What did you want mm -hmm. to be when you grew up? Uh, I wanted to be in the CIA. I wanted to be, I wanted to be, or the military. And uh, I couldn't because I couldn't be in the military. I want to do military intelligence because I was gay. And at the time, uh, uh, continuing into today, there's a lot of problems. But at the time, it was don't ask, don't tell. And I didn't want to do, I wanted to tell. I wanted them to ask. And so it wasn't really, it didn't work out. Um, so I couldn't join the military. And so I went to, um, I had gone to the foreign service school at Georgetown University and studied international affairs. And I thought I would, I would possibly do some sort of service, some sort of service to government. But then uh, when it's journalism. Let's put a timestamp on this. About what age were you when you were thinking about going into the CIA? I mean, like, were you <laughs> like five years well, old at your no, like, no, in no, kindergarten? No, no. I, and... no, I don't know what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I don't, I wasn't one of those kids that had a goal or anything like that. I didn't, I want to be this when I grow up. I wasn't like that. Um, but when I got to school, I, I really did think it was important to serve. I wanted to do analysis. I was really good at analyzing things. And so I wanted, I was super interested in international affairs and being posted abroad and working in the military. And so I want to unpack that a little bit more. Maybe we'll mm -hmm. down the stream a little bit. But, and the reason I ask, I ask it with context, because I think right now, you know, we're going through another period of extraordinary times, right? So there's, sure. in my mind, of course, there's several camps of people. I don't want to overgeneralize, but I will oversimplify. And that is there's two camps. There's one, you know, there's, uh, you know, kids like mine and maybe yours who are coming out of school mm -hmm. and thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Yeah. And then there's a whole rest of us who are middle age uh, who have either been downsized, lost their job, mm -hmm. the economy's turned us upside down, and we're, th we're trying to reset and we're thinking, what are we going to do with our lives? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about signals early on? So how did you, like, what were some of the signals that you knew you wanted to serve? It's interesting that you mm -hmm. wanted to go into specifically the CIA because that's, I think, a very... Well, military intelligence, one of them, something like that. I, I was interested in propaganda. I was in, I was always interested in the uses of propaganda and uh, influencing people and and what influences people and how societies get shifted, um, including technological influences. So I was always interested in how things um, scenario building and how things happen. My dad was in the military. Probably that was that interest, um, but that wasn't primarily why. I just thought it was. I thought it was really important to serve. I think it's. I think it's sort of a canard that people who are liberal don't care, aren't patriotic. I think it's crap actually um and so uh i i thought i think it's really important to have a civic m mentality about things and that was one way i thought would work and it was appealing to me what branch of the service was your dad in the navy navy okay mm -hmm. and was your was your mom in the picture uh, yeah she was she was just she didn't work much um she was a, a housewife precisely but uh uh, after my dad died when I was little, um, she remarried and they had money and so she didn't do a whole lot of things, but we were very hardworking. My family, my bro brothers and I are incredibly hardworking. Um, and you know, I've had jobs ever since I was in high school, you know, ever, I mean, I worked quite a lot, um, and I continue to work all the time and I shift careers really, uh, substantively during my long career. It's, it's been on the same trajectory in journalism, but I, I've, I've moved with the times with the technologies and I, I'm really, I've been very adept, I think about shifting as times shift and I don't have an issue with sticking around in things that aren't working. Yeah. Your brother's a, a doctor, pretty notable doctor, mm -hmm. right? And uh, well, to, him, to himself. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's, I'd say he's prolific. I mean, he's, I see him yeah. out there on the interwebs. He's on the and, internet. <laughs> he likes the Twitter. Yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Twitter. yeah. And, Twitter. and, and it seems like you're proud of him. He has a blog now. Yeah. I'm very proud. He's a wonderful guy. And it also seems like you're very proud of your mother. You talk about, you know, bringing her to mm -hmm. shows and uh, yeah. your relationship with her and. Mm hmm. Well, proud is it was it would be stretching it. I'm sad. we're having some issues with her because of uh, her 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 resistance to calling coronavirus anything but the flu. Initially, she's she's speaking of propaganda. She spends a lot of time on Fox News, and so we spent a lot of time 
uh, disabusing her of the fact that the election is not a fraud and things like that. So, uh, you know, it's the normal, normal family stuff in the 2020 in America, which is families torn apart by political partisanship. So maybe that's a good segue into something I am always curious about, and I can tell you why. Um, I'm curious about nature versus nurture. What is your take on that? Like, what is that? Where does that sort of um, call to duty, almost like this sense of obligation to like serve your hard work ethic? Where does that come from? Do you think that's born, or was that was it learned? No, it's, I think it's learned partly, partially. I think there's some people people have a nature. I have children. I have several children. I have three children, and uh, they're all different. And the way they are was the way they were born. One, my oldest son is is always been very happy. It was very happy from and very easy to also easy to, to get to do things too. You know I mean? He's just, my other one's much more stubborn and, um, uh, and, and more wary. My daughter is, uh, very confident, uh, very happy, very in charge. And, and so people have their personalities when they come out. Um, but you can, you can, they can be impacted easily by events. Um, so how you raise someone, the kind of love you give them, the kind of attention, uh, the kind of, um, you know, how you focus on them, how things of external things happen to them in the world, uh, can change people's trajectory really dramatically. Um, and, and move them and maybe even sharpen some of the edges that they already had in ways that aren't so positive. Um, I was just watching this really wonderful movie that's up for an Academy Award, Promising Young Woman, which, uh, which is a really tough movie, but great. And here's someone, the whole point of it is she was, pro- they thought she was promising because she was in a medical career. I thought she was very promising what she ended up doing, even though it was disastrous, you know? So it's a, it's a really interesting question of what promising is, um, to people. Yeah. And so was there an event in your life that sort of, you know, changed the trajectory of, of how My dad's death? That's it. That was it. That was the only one. I mean, there's lots of things like different career turns, but they're just, they happen all the time. I think people um, think there has to be this great grand moment of like, this is when everything started. I think one of the things that's really important is, is that you shift constantly. And I do that all the time. Like one day I decided I wanted to not work for a newspaper anymore. I wanted to start my own thing. I was very entrepreneurial and I was tired of saying I'm better I know better. Just, well, if I know better, I should go do it. You know what I mean? Like, not a lot of people do that. You know, I think not a lot of people do that, but I did. I have a a personality trait that is like, well, stop stop talking, Kara, and do something about it. Um, When was that, by the way? Oh, I did it lots of times. I do it all the time. I do it even today. Um, One of the one that was in when I started um, All Things D and the All Things D conference with Walt Mossberg. But it was also when I left the Washington Post to go to the Wall Street Journal to cover the internet. I was cover. I was on a very good trajectory to be a very top reporter covering the White House at the Wall at the New York at the Washington Post. Big deal. Um, I was an up and coming writer, but I moved quickly to cover the internet. No one heard of the internet in the early 1990s. What's that, Kara? Um, and I just had a feeling about it. And so I moved off a trajectory to another one that I thought was more interesting. Same thing when I, then I decided to sell, um, all things, fund all things D and to recode and then to sell it. And then after doing that for a little bit, I decided, ah, this podcast thing looks interesting five, six years ago before it became a thing. And so I tend to try to follow my instinct of what would be interesting and what's interesting to me. Um, but I don't think there's any one. It, people just, you just have to be aware of turns and most people just continue and say, you know, a job they don't like very much for a very long time because they don't think they have other options. I always, the gate's always open as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I can, I can leave. Uh, I, I think the only thing would be the death of my dad when I was five. That certainly, that was a major event for me. Can you share more of how you felt about that? I, I actually recently. I was five, so. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I lost my father last year, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and it was devastating. And uh, mm-hmm. it was out of the blue. I didn't expect it. Uh, he mm-hmm. was young, 69 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't imagine uh, you're five. You know, you didn't have a sense of what was going on. But but how did it no, affect you? You say it was it was a profound change, but. How did it affect you? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of 
literature on this. There's a lot of studies about this and what happens to people who lose parents at a young age. And, uh, you know, just imagine, it, you know, right now, if half your friends died, like your parents, when you're five, are really pretty much your entire world or most of the world. You don't have very many fr- real friends. You have people you play in the sandbox with, but you certainly don't have friends. You have your siblings. Um, but if you imagine, really, they are your world. And so if one half of your friends all just suddenly died, it's that kind of, that's how I kind of look at it. Like what? Like it would be shocking and devastating. And so I think it also gives you a sense of, of the, capri- the capriciousness of life, that life can change on a dime, that things, bad things happen and you're, you survive them just fine. You know what I mean? Like you just keep going. And so I think at that age, it t- taught me a lot of lessons. A lot of people whose, whose parents have died at a young age, at a young age, not older, um, they're called, they often become highly functional. Um, which means essentially they just very little gets in their way and they don't tend to dwell too much. I think I'm pretty, I think that is a, I think I tend to be fine with moving on like next, whatever. I don't get, I don't get bogged down by failure. I don't get bogged down by success. I would guess that you have to grow up quickly too. Yeah. In a lot of ways. My mom was not, not as good a parent as my dad was. So she wasn't a terrible parent. It just was, he was more attentive to us as kids. And, um, you know, it just gives you a dose of reality pretty quickly. Um, and so you end up being, um, um, you end up taking care of yourself in a lot of ways. Yeah. I've seen it go both ways. I've seen, you know, let's call it adversity, you know, when it punches you in the mouth, uh, Mm -hmm. Mike Tyson's famous for saying everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Uh, you seem to be someone who got back up and kept yeah. fighting. Yeah. Other people stay down and they're out for the count, you know. Um, so I, I really think adversity can either kick your ass um, yeah. or you can get up, mm-hmm. shake your, you know, dust yourself off and, and keep going. Yeah. Um, I ask about nature and nurture a lot. And I'll, I'll share a little bit with you. I've shared uh, publicly last year um, mm-hmm. very spontaneously uh, mm-hmm. at a major event in front of 500 people, strangers, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for the very first time that, that I'm adopted. Oh. And, um, and I shared my adoption story because uh, mm-hmm. I had been in search of my birth parents for 25, 30 years. And mm-hmm. uh, it had been a long search. And um, I, I'm always curious about nature versus nurture because I, I'm curious about my own self. I think that's my main selfish pursuit is to figure out, Mm -hmm. you know, who I am and why I behave like I do. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was both the, you know, most incredible, but most terrible experience at the same time. I found my Mm -hmm. mom, uh, but it turns out she did not want to be found. Uh And and that was surprising. And -hmm. then I found my dad um, Mm -hmm. and he did want to be found. He was, uh, you know, a hippie, um, very liberal uh, Jew, you know, mm-hmm. uh, open-minded, you know, had mm-hmm. uh, followed the Grateful Dead and lived in Haight-Ashbury, you know, a San Francisco guy, uh, super colorful, interesting person. Um, but it was hard for me to reconcile um, my mom's side just because I, I never got contact. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, so I have a whole side of the family, the DNA side that I, I haven't cracked the code yet. But uh, mm-hmm. that's why I ask about signals and, and nature and nurture and oh, all that's that. That's a story. Steve Jobs had a similar thing. You know, he, he when he when he was uh, looking looking for his family, he did find his sister. I think that was important to him more so than his parents. Um, and he had a very close relationship with his, with his um, adopted parents. And I think it hurt. I think he recognized who what parents really are. They aren't necessarily the people who birthed you. But you know, it's, these days it's so much. It's such a complex issue, um, and there's so many people with that, that have pa- families in different ways. My uh, sons just found two of their half sisters, which was kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, using, there's all these sort of tools, uh, that you can find these things now, which is fascinating in a lot of ways, but also opens up who, who and what we are. For sure. Uh, how well did you know Steve Jobs? Very well. I interviewed him dozens of times, dozen times more. Yeah. And I, I saw him more than that. Yeah. What I read about him, and I don't know, maybe you can confirm this is he sort of had this chip on his shoulder, almost like to, no. Almost to prove, uh, it goes back to adoption, that he was, you know, trying to prove something that, yeah. that I, and I also yeah. heard anecdotally about a story about he met his dad in a cafe and sort of, you know, brushed him he off. He went there. He went, he didn't brush him off. That's a lot of the stories you should actually do with everything. Uh, he, he, uh, he did meet his father. He was disappointed by his father. Um, I don't, he didn't, um, 
he, he, he didn't realize he had been in his restaurant, I think is what it was. Uh, uh, he, um, but he did meet them. And I think he was less impressed with his parents than he thought he would be, but he was very happy to see his sister. Right. Um, I don't think he had a chip on his shoulder. I think he, you know, like a lot of people, when you get, um, you know, I think he, he probably, he was, he was not an easy personality, but a lot of people aren't easy personalities. I think he had a lot of vision. I think he had a lot of heart. I think sometimes he had too much heart. Um, but he definitely, you know, like a lot of people who lived in public, they have a lot of negatives and positives. And, um, but I don't think he was trying to prove anything from his parents. I, I've talked, I talked to him a great deal about that issue. Um, and, uh, he Did he feel to, misunderstood? I think he wanted to say, you don't, your parents aren't always your parents. I think that was the message he wanted to. So. Well, I would agree with that. Um, I know that mm -hmm. firsthand. Uh, yeah. But um, did he feel misunderstood, do you think? No, I think he was very understood. I, I don't know. I think, he, no, I don't. Uh, and you've grappled and wrestled with um, tech billionaires and tech stars over the years. Um, you've been titled like one of the most feared people mm -hmm. in Silicon yes, Valley. So. And you also happen to be female, um, yeah. which I think is an interesting. Fear is a word they use by females that ask questions, just so you know, because they're scary. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> by the most powerful people in the world, I'm sure. They're terrified. Yes, I love it. And, and I was especially uh, impressed just with your last podcast with Elon. I know mm -hmm. you've talked to Elon many times. I'm sure you're, mm -hmm. you got him on speed dial. But there was a moment in that interview, do you remember, when you were sort of pressing the issue, and I can't even remember exactly what it was, but he sort of got a little bit nasty. He turned a little bit negative. Yes. And mm -hmm. he said, uh, Kara, I'm happy to end this interview immediately. Mm -hmm. And you said, no, thanks. Yeah. It was just like, yeah. Bing, like Captain America. It's because he's done it before. He's done that before. He likes to do that. And, he, you know, he wants everyone to go, oh, no, no, dear sir. You know, and really, he wants people to get shook up by whatever. He can leave if he wants. I'm not his mama. You know, that's how I feel. Like, you want, you go ahead. You're an adult. Leave if you want. I, we're having a discussion. You don't like all of it. And I can't help you if you want to leave. I don't, I, you don't need my permission. It was like a threat. It was silly. He was just being silly. Yeah, but is that just peacocking though? Is that what it is? I don't know. He just was mad about something. No, it's just his thing. I could do he every now and then he realizes he's the richest man in the world. He could do whatever he wants. But so can anyone else. That's my feeling. So I think that's what he's, he's like, wait a second, I'm Elon Musk. I could leave if I want. I guess I don't know. I have no idea what he was going through his head. But he didn't leave, so he didn't. So Well, maybe let's frame this as advice to other journalists or people that are trying to tell stories. What advice do you give them when you come up with with a you know, up against a big personality like that and you get a little bit of pushback? Just so what? Like don't worry about it. Like don't like I don't I don't like you know, I'm not I don't stay up at night worrying about what Elon or anyone else thinks of me. I really don't. I could care less. And I, do, I don't, not to say I care or don't care either. Um, I try to be fair. I try to be polite. Um, I try to ask tough questions. I respect their intelligence. Um, if they don't want to answer questions, they don't have to answer questions, but they have to live with what they say. And so I don't like, I don't get angry at anybody I'm talking to necessarily. I just like, all right, I'm, I ask this very tough question. I try to ask the toughest questions I can. And, and, ho and by tough, I don't mean, I don't, I mean hard, like really difficult and thoughtful questions. And I think one of the things that always sticks to people that ask like that, oh, you're so mean or something like that. Why is it mean to ask, I don't know, Elon about his issues around COVID? Well, how could, how, and, and ask it very directly because I'm respectful to him. How could you have tweeted that about COVID? I think that's irresponsible. And, and then I said I thought it was irresponsible. So he knew where I was coming from. I asked a direct question, and he, he gave actually a, an answer. It wasn't an answer I liked, but it was an answer. And so, um, but I, I think you just have to have respect to see people where you're coming from and be very honest. And I think most smart people do not resist that. They don't, like, they, they, they might not give you an answer you like, but I don't, like, um, they don't shake me up. Like, I don't care. They're not, again, I'm not their mama. So... Let me ask a little bit further, which is Elon's mother at that moment and yelling at a journalist like that. I just said, don't ever talk to someone like that again. But that's different. Yeah. But is is that the case? Are you able to do that because you have this great pedigree now or this great breadth of experience? Yeah. Like, was it the same way when yeah. you first started your career? Yes. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like, I don't, I don't, I don't like you either have to be secure in yourself or not. I just, if it, it, you know, I wasn't as knowledgeable. 
that's different. Like I didn't have as much knowledge. Now I have a lot of knowledge and I have a lot of experience and a lot of expertise, but that doesn't mean my judgment is perfect either, by the way, you know, all kinds of studies about people who have lots of experience making bad judgments or different judgments than the correct judgment. And so I, what I like to do is I just, I, 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 I try to do my best work of research and then, and, and knowing what I'm talking about, I try to read widely when I'm talking to people, I try to know what, what, what they've said about things before. I have respect enough to have spent time to know what they've said. And then when they start to move into talking points, I try to get that out of the way really quickly. I'm like, listen, that's your talking point. I did it with Brian the other day, Chesky. He was looking down at a sheet. I said, put your put your eyes up at me. Don't look at the sheet. Look at me. Answer the question. And he was sort of jarred out of it. And we had a much better conversation. So I just treat people like I would normally like anyone. So I don't just because they're billionaires doesn't mean they get a passive. Like, aren't you so smart? Or, but I also don't treat them like they're evil either. Like you awful evil villain. You know. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about you is uh, I feel like you speak the truth, or you, you know you try to you're in pursuit of the truth. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me about your process of doing the research. How much research do you do? Now, you have the uh, advantage of, you know, being mm-hmm. a career journalist, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, following these people. You know, I heard you talk to Mark Cuban and you were reminiscing, you know, back in the day before oh, Mark yeah. was mm-hmm. uh, a billionaire. Yeah. And, yeah, and so you have that advantage of, of knowing them before they were famous. Um, mm-hmm. But what, what is your process to do the research? Oh, I just read widely. You know, I know a lot. A lot of stuff I know people for years. I mean, I've covered him for a long time. So I, I have a lot of a well of knowledge is just in my head about him. And I know what he's going to say. And I know what I want to talk about, like, of the time. But I know what they're doing right now and what they've said about it and people's negative and positive thoughts about it. And so I just read widely. We have a good staff at the Times. Um and on Pivot, I already know the stories. I've read them all. You know, we, that's much more topical. So I do a lot of research. And then we put out, like, we figure out a good narrative script in terms of how we want the, in, the, in, the interviews to go. And then, um, and then we, I go off of them when it doesn't, when something changes, when they say something interesting. I go, I'll, I'll throw away the script and move to a different direction if I need to. <clears throat> so, I, excuse me, I spent a lot of time listening to people. So uh, specifically, are you reading other people's articles? I mean, obviously, when you Sometimes. talk to Bill Gates, you you know you read Bill's book, and I you, read his book, you, right? Yeah, you know, you you had commentary on that, and you had questions. I thought you did a great job, yeah. sort of pushing back. And maybe it's interesting to see someone like Gates, who's gone through this evolution of being yeah. um, like Murdoch is the Uncle Satan to now, you know, no, this philanthropist. Still, no, Murdoch is always Uncle Satan. I'm sorry to tell you, but Bill was there for a while, right? Like he was the most hated man. He was Zuckerberg, really. You know, he was. He was. It was very different. Uh, the, the, Bill Gates's issues were about dominance and about dominance over an industry, not not the wholesale tarnishing of a civilization. Murdoch is going to have a lot to speak for when he dies, I think. That, he's a very different creature. I would take Bill Gates any every day and twice on Sunday to Rupert Murdoch. Do you think Zuckerberg's the archetype of, of Gates? Uh, I think Mark over time will evolve, I hope. Um I think the, the job he has is so quantumly important and he is so not able to handle it, just like very men, very few people would be able to handle it. I, 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 I respect him for trying. I just don't think it's what he's built is possible to manage in the way he hopes it could be. And, and the fact that he has no uh, accountability is really difficult. I think if you don't, if the, if the, if the guillotine's not going to drop at some point, you don't, there's no, there's no, there's no accountability. Like, there's got to be accountability. Why don't you think uh, Mark is capable of handling this? Is it a lack of big. emotional it's intelligence? Is it- no, of course and- he has emotional intelligence. It doesn't matter. It, no person can figure out how to deal with all these problems in real time. This is He's talking about um, managing the human race and their communications and how everybody's thoughts and th- negative and positive flowing through his platform. And, and, and it's being used by a lot of negativity, you know, a lot of really dangerous information. And so having to make those calls in real time in the, in the mass that's coming in, it's just not a job for one person. And it's not a job, uh, not that he's making every decision, but it's, it, he, you know, the buck does stop with him uh, on lots of big issues. But can't he surround um, himself with really smart people who, you know, no, knows these things? Enough people. What he's built is, it, it's, it's a huge, it's, 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 it's Who's in charge of all communication? It, that's what it is. Like, I don't forget, 60, 70% of people read their news on Facebook. In some countries, it's 90. Uh, you know, he's, it's like as if we had someone running the internet. 
We don't have someone running. It just does itself, right? Nobody runs the internet, but someone runs Facebook and Facebook is the internet to a lot of people. So, And how about Jack over at Twitter? Is it the same situation? Well, it's smaller. That's just because the media loves it. It's a much smaller. I mean, it has, it has its resonance because of Donald Trump and him being on the platform, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, again, for example, in, in throwing Trump off the, um, off the two platforms, essentially, two people made that decision in the world, two people to change the course of history, right? I'm good with their decision because I took, I think it took them too long to make. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Was it too long? Too but late? Good decision. Finally, when the things, things were getting pretty hot, they didn't want to be that linked with terrorism, essentially domestic terrorism, but it was just two people what? Like, huh? Like, I don't know. Even if it's a good decision, you know, someone, I don't know, there's about to be a nuclear war and it's not supposed to be and one person stops it. Good. But why is one person stopping it? Like, what? What? Like, you know, that makes you worried. Too much power. And that's, that's Murdoch's problem too, right? The media empire. In his way. Well, he's a different, he doesn't have as much power as they do. It's a good thing he doesn't have the power they have. That's what I say. Let's switch gears to some of the things that you love. You've, you've recently talked to people like Brian Cranston and, and mm -hmm. other actors. It seems like you yep. are a, a big fan of pop culture and TV and movies. Yeah. Um, I've also heard you talk about, you know, aliens and Bigfoot and all these things yeah, you're fascinated that. with. Yeah. Uh, I just spoke to Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's the oh, astrophysicist, and I asked him about... Uh, I said, Neil, I just want to know your position on three things uh, in this order, Bigfoot, aliens, and God. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you weigh in on that for me? Oh, gosh. Uh, Bigfoot? Um, I, I, no, no. <laughs> I think it's a bear. <laughs> I, I like that it's there, though. You know, I kind of like, though. I like those kind of mythologies. They're sort of conspiracy theory, theories that are benign, right? They're kind of benign conspiracy. So, I don't mind the Loch Ness Monster. I'm like, okay, sure. Um, I, um, I think it's interesting. I, I always read everything about it. It's not like I don't read about it. Um, I think, uh, oh, the conspiracy theories, none of them. Like, they're all insane, but they're, um, but they're amusing to look at because most of them are plots of movies. Um, like there's a, a recent QAnon conspiracy theory that Trump and, uh, and Biden switched faces. And actually Trump is running the White House now. And nobody knows it, although, you know, it feels, feels a little liberal. Um, but I was like, that was a movie with Nicolas Cage and John Travolta called Face Off, just so you know. Remember? Like, every one of their conspiracy theories is a movie. I was like, that was a movie. And I'm, of course, I love sci-fi, and so I watched all the movies. Um, uh, what was the second one? You're a Star Trek yeah. fan, right? I'm a Star Trek fan, not a Star Wars fan. Right. No, I heard you talk to Stacey Abrams about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who's your Star Trek character? Who are you? most associated with oh oh god i don't know i like a lot of them probably picard i like picard picard uh maybe spock in a lot of ways i like spock um and then aliens i sure sure i can't believe we're not the only life i don't know what form they'll take but sure i'm good with that i'm good with believing that that's possible um i don't know about the people visiting us and operating on us i think that's i just don't know why they always settle in rural areas they ever go to a city like <laughs> Like, you know, they never show up at the, you know, Harvard, like they never take someone from Harvard. They just, anyway. Well, there's um, this Venn diagram now between us, you know, yeah. you, me and Neil deGrasse Tyson, we, we agree there's overlap. Yeah. So yeah. if okay. that sets your minds at ease at all. One, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm an, I'm not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I have no idea. And so I don't know. There's, there's some order to the universe. It's clear when you look at nature, there's some beauty and uh, symmetry to it, but now that might just be science. Yeah. Uh, uh, what have you learned about yourself as a person who is now a mother of three? Mm -hmm. um, now a mother. I've been a mother for 20 years, but okay. Right. Like, so what have you learned about yourself in hindsight, um, sort of taking inventory a little bit? And, um, and, and this means a lot to me because I'm also a father, so I have, I have four children. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And being someone who's adopted, I have, I have this interesting perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just curious to hear it from your point of view. Uh, I think that uh, parenting is the most important thing I've done. I think it really is. I think I'm pretty good at it. Uh, I think I am. I think my kids think I am. Um, I think it's very important to 
do that part right. Like the best to really be be there. I haven't been there the whole time. I've done a lot of work. I work a lot. And um, what makes you good at it? Some mistakes. What does what does being good at it mean? What makes you good at it? Um, I think I don't. I think you'd be surprised, but I'm not very uh, heavy handed. I, I I let them. Um, you know, I have different parenting styles from my ex. Um, I don't look at their homework. I don't care if they <laughs> finish their homework. I. I want them to take responsibility for themselves if they, it's after a certain age, certainly not when they were younger. Uh, but on some level, uh, I'm always like, what do you think? Let them make their decisions. And, you know, I don't like this. Not like, what do you think about taking drugs or drink, the, the drinking and driving? That's not what I'm talking about. But I like them to, to make their to learn to make their decisions and take responsibility for them um, and good decisions. And, and I often say, well, that's a decision. I don't know if it's a good one but it's a decision. You know what I mean? Like make, make good decisions. I often say to them when they leave the house. It seems like a very uh, Socrates way of raising your children. You know, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. You know, it's sort of like, you know, the, the, the teacher will appear when the student is ready. And then, you know, Socrates, the Socratic method is all about saying, well, I don't overachieve at them. I don't think they, I don't think it does any good. I see a lot of parents that are, um, you know, the whole thing with like my son is like, oh, if I do this, I'll get an A in this. I said, just do it because you like it. Like, do not do anything for a grade or maybe if I do this club, it'll be good for college. I'm like, please don't do that. Please, for the love of God, don't do that because you'll be on an achievement wheel your whole life. And by the way, you'll never catch up. And so the, the things I've done in my career is I've, everything I've done, I've liked myself. Like, I like it. It makes me happy. When I'm happy, I create jobs. <laughs> when I'm happy, I am creative. And so I really do push among my kids, like, please don't do anything for being a good boy or a good, just, just don't. I'd rather you watch a movie. Like, I'd rather you not um, uh, try to, like, be performative for some dumb thing like getting into college. Like, you either get into college or not, just enjoy your learning. And so I think some of the teachers hate me because I'm always like, that homework's useless. And they're like, it is? I'm like, absolutely. Let me just tell you, this is what you need to do to be successful in the workplace. You need to learn how to be on teams. You need to learn how to be um, th- uh, creative. You need to be thoughtful about how you, and intentional. And I was like, these are the things you don't teach in school. Learning, whatever you're learning here is not, the way you're learning it is not going to, memorization is really not, gonna, unless you want to be a doctor, yes, you should know chemistry, Right. But if you want to do this, you don't need this. And so I want them to learn for learning's sake and no other reason. And I just can't, I I hate watching a lot. We're in D.C. now. We used to be in San Francisco. It was a lot easier to be able to push this. But, you know, there's a lot of kids that are just wrapped. They're they're, they're, they're wrapping themselves around an axle of achievement. And let me tell you, there's always someone better than you. And you will never win that particular game. So do what you like. Do what you like because you have the freedom and the privilege to be in a society, even as tough as it is with COVID and not everybody, lots of people are suffering and different people are suffering, but many of the people my kids are around are very lucky. And um, it doesn't mean they can't be sad. It doesn't mean they can't be depressed about what's going on. They can't grieve the things they're missing, but that they shouldn't be doing things for no, for any reason, except that it either helps the world or they like it themselves. One of the favorite things I heard you say on a a podcast of the past two, I think you were talking about uh, crimes and murders and and different Mm -hmm. things. And you said, uh, you know, if, if my, if my child committed a crime, I would definitely 100% turn them into the authorities. (laughs) Scott got mad. You were talking about the, Oh, it was Brian Cranston. It was the show on that. That's a plot point. The, the, you know it from the beginning, so I'm not giving you anything, but he shields his son from his son's done a hit and run. And he, goes to take a minute turns out a mobster is is the kid that got mobster's kid and so he decides to it has lots of repercussions that are negative for other people not his son and so um i just i don't know i would turn him in. i think people should be responsible i you know i'm thinking about this a lot with the promising young woman because nobody turned that person in or they didn't drop the dime on them and look what happened like the repercussions are vast well there's so. uh, there's this precedence on this too look at nazi germany look at mm-hmm. the whole trump era i mean there's lots of different things yeah. uh one of the things that you admit that you're bad at is vulnerability i love that interview with Brene <laughs> brown 
No, no. She called me Brene Brown, the queen of vulnerability, said I'm the most vulnerable person she's ever met. Well, so so I agree with Brene, but you think that you were bad at it. So um, I don't think I was bad at it. I just don't, I don't use the word vulnerability. I don't mind. I, I think I, I look at it. It's like, I, I, I am not scared. I think vulnerability is not weakness. I think it's a strength. I think I'm not scared of negative things happening. I'm not scared of disaster. I'm not scared of, I'm scared. What I always say when my sons are scared, my, my daughter's too young to articulate this, but, um, someone said, what are you scared of? I said, things that are scary. Otherwise not really, you know what I mean? And so there's, there's a very limited number of things that are actually scary and I'm, uh, I'm appropriately scared of them, but everything else I really couldn't give a fuck. Yeah. I mean, do you think you built that thick skin one it's from, thick. it's not thick. It's real. No, what's thick about it? I'm not hiding from it. I'm accepting it. Well, you're going in there many, in many cases, what looks like a David versus Goliath. You know, you're the David against this. Are they, are they literally going to hurt me in any way that is going to affect my life? And No, there's no real danger for me. There's no, I, I have to, I'm appropriate with danger. If I was with a shark swimming in a pool, I'd be appropriately terrified. Otherwise, Bill Gates is not scary. I'm sorry. They're just, it's not a challenge. Yeah. Well, I'm not trying to make the argument. I, I'm actually, I'm, okay. I'm enjoying that. I'm pulling this out because yeah. I think it's a message that a lot of people need to hear. Um, be scared of things that are scary. That's pretty much, it's like, there's another piece of advice. And then I do have to go is, um, there, J Jim Barksdale ran Netscape. He had a book of all these sayings. If you, he was the CEO of Netscape and didn't work out. Netscape didn't work out, but he was a lovely guy and a really fantastic CEO in many ways. Um, and, and one of the things, he had a book of aphorisms that he would say all the time. He was from, um, Mississippi. And so he'd always have like, you know, some Mississippi saying or whatever, um, you know, there was corn cobs involved or something like that or chickens or whatever. And, but one thing he did say was, um, remember to keep the main thing, the main thing. And I always thought that was really, I think about that all the time. Whenever I'm like drawn up, I'm like, oh, keep the main thing, the main thing. Stop going everywhere else. And so I tend to keep the main thing, the main thing. And then you're do, you do fine if you do that. Yeah. I think that's a great soundbite to end on. Kara, it's been a pleasure. I hope this Thank will not you. be our last conversation. I'm, yes. I'm fascinated with you and your work. <laughs> I'm fascinating. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. Um, you're Thank sort of you. my hero in many ways. Good. And Good. Well, you do a great job of interviewing. I'm sorry I got to go, but I actually have to go play basketball with my kid who's six feet two and I'm five foot two and I'm going to get my ass kicked. So I, 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 have, I cannot be late for this. Mm.